somewhat free-form celebration of a man's life uh, in very brief form. I'm afraid we don't have a whole lot of time to do it. Uh, plus, we've got a couple of actors who've got to go act in Corey Lance. Bruce asked me to let you know that the reason he looks this way is because in an hour he's going to be a starving Roman citizen, <laughs> raising all hell in the streets of Rome. Right. He's been up all night. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he looks so well. Um, so this celebration is going to be quite is somewhat free form. Uh, we'll be doing some reminiscing and some performing of things that have a particular meaning to us uh, in relation to Angus Bomer, who is the founder of the festival. Is there anyone here who doesn't know who Angus Bomer was? Terrific. Okay, that solves that. I would like to read. Um, a, a very important message that was written by Jerry Turner about last year, and last year, of course, is the year that Angus died after 44 years of leadership with the festival. The question we must ask ourselves is, can we survive the 80s without our leader and friend? It depends, it seems to me, on whether we have learned well enough the meaning of what Angus Bomer established and guided here, or whether we only knew and loved him without absorbing what he stood for. The plays of Shakespeare survived the man... Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, did somebody want you? <laughs> The plays of Shakespeare survived the man because they carry the great human spirit he must have embodied. They are, in fact, the man. In the same way, we must live in hope that the festival is indeed the embodiment of the artist who guided it, that we are, in some mystic way, the living autobiography of his soul. The great secret Angus Bomer had, and which he shared with his public, was that a theater deals with human commonplaces accessible to us all. Somehow, in the words of Shakespeare and in all the great plays of all the great playwrights, there are human truths that need expression so we all can know most vividly what it is to be alive. And in celebration of that gentleman's spirit, uh, and Jerry's too, for that matter, uh, those of us who are here would like to talk a little bit about Angus. This is Rex Raybould, Bruce Scooch, Philip Davidson, James Edmondson, and my name is Peggy Rubin. And first, oh goodness, we decided, do you want to introduce it, will you? Yeah, yeah. All right, and why? We're doing it. Uh, this is a uh, still-formed piece. Uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead is the selection. It was a play that Angus directed, the first play that Angus directed. I believe it opened up the Bomer Theater uh, that season. Odd not to choose a Shakespeare, but somewhat related, since the characters come out of the play Hamlet, of course. Uh, I will be doing either Rosencrantz or Guildenstern, and Bruce will be doing the other one. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I don't think we need any more information. Where's the prince going? Uh, this, oh, we'll have him walk. Right okay, the there. prince will be walking over you, just duck, and uh, he'll be going. <laughs> <laughs> I want to go home. 
Don't let the confusion come over my head. I'll soon be home. I'm out of my step. Oh, it's all voting to a head. It's all heading to a dead. It's all heading to a dead stop! Whatever happened to you, you can't remember how to spell the word wife or house because when you write it down, you can't ever remember having seen those letters in that particular order before? I remember. Yes? Uh, what have we got to go on? Hamlet's transformation? Mm -hmm. We've been briefed. What do you recollect? Well, he's changed, hasn't he? Small I mean, him to pleasures. Uh, uh, something more than his father's death. He's always uh, talking about us. We cheer him up. Find out what's the matter. Exactly. Ah. It's a matter of asking the right questions and getting away as little as we can. It's a game. And then we can go. And receive such thanks as fits the remembrance of a king. Hey, what do you suppose he means by that? Well, difficult to say, really. Some kings tend to be amnesia. Yeah. The other is the opposite, I suppose. No, 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 it's no, elephantine. No. Not how long, how, not how long, how much retentive. He's a very retentive king, a royal retainer. <laughs> what are you playing at? Words. Words. They're all we have to go on. Shouldn't we be doing something more constructive? What do you have in mind? A short, blunt human pyramid? <laughs> we could go. Where? After him. Why? We've been placed. If we start moving about now, we'll be chasing each other all night. How very intriguing. I feel like a spectator. An appalling business. The only thing that makes it bearable is the irrational belief that someone will come in in a moment. Do you see anyone? No, you. No. Mm -hmm. No, oh, this is a fine persecution, to be kept intrigued without ever really being enlightened. <clears throat> We've had no practice. Uh, oh, we could, uh, we could play questions. What good would that do? Practice! Statement one, love. Cheating. How? I haven't started yet. Statement two, love. Are you counting that? What? Are you counting that? Oh, no repetition, three, love. I'm not going to believe you're going to be like that! Who, oh, sir? Huh? Foul, no grunts, love one. Oh, who's go? Why? Why not? What for? Foul, no synonyms, why? What in God's name's going on? Foul, no rhetoric, two, one. <laughs> What does it all add up to? Can't you guess? Who are you addressing me? Is there anyone else? Who? How should I know? Why do you ask? Are you serious? Is that rhetoric? No. Statement to all of day one. <laughs> What's the matter with you today? When? What? Why? Are you dead? Are you dead? Yes or no? Is there a question? Is there a choice? Is there a God? Foul no non sequitur. Three, two, one, game over. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? What's yours? Uh, I ask you first. Statement one love. What's your name when you're at home? What's yours? When I'm at home? Is it different at home? What home? Haven't you got one? Why do you ask? What are you driving at? What's your name? Repetition to love, match point to me! Who do you think you are? Rhetoric, game, and match! <laughs> Where's it going to end? That's the question. It's all questions. Do you think it matters? Doesn't matter to you. Why should it matter? Doesn't matter why. Doesn't it matter why it matters? What's the matter with you? Doesn't matter. I see. <laughs> What's the game? What are the rules? Rosencrantz? What? Got it in your hand. Oh. I take my hat off of you. Shake hands. All right. Now, I'll tell you. <laughs> Gildenstern! No, 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 no. Not yet. Catch me unaware. Right, right. You ready? <laughs> Don't be stupid. Gildenstern! What? <laughs> Consistency is all I ask. Immortality is all I seek. Give us this day our daily week. Uh, <laughs> who was that? Didn't you know him? He didn't know me. He didn't see you. I didn't see him. Now we shall see. Uh -huh. He's changed. I hardly knew him. No, you could see that. He transformed. How do you know? Inside and out. I see. It's not himself. Well, he's changed. I could see that. <laughs> Glean what afflicts him. Me? Him. Huh? Question and answer, old ways are the best. Well, he's changed. You question, I'll answer. He's not himself. I'm him, you see. Who am I then? You're yourself. And he's you? Not a bit of it. Are you afflicted? That's the idea, are you ready? Let's go back a bit. <laughs> I'm afflicted. I see. Glean what afflicts me. Right. Question and answer. How should I begin? Address me. Uh, my dear Gildenstern. <laughs> You've forgotten, haven't you? Oh. 
My dear Rosencrantz. <laughs> I don't think you understand. Huh? <laughs> what we are attempting here is a hypothesis in which I answer for him while you ask me questions. Ready? Do you know what to do? What? Are you stupid? Pardon? Are you deaf? Did you speak? Not now. Statement! Not now! <laughs> if I had any doubts or hopes, rather they've all been dispelled, what could we possibly have in common except our situation? Perhaps he'll pass this way again. Should we go? Where? Oh, you mean you pretend to be him and I ask you questions. Very good. You had me confused. I could see that I have. How should I should begin. Address me. Ah, my honored lord. My dear Rosencrantz. Am I pretending to be you then? Certainly not. If you like. All right, all right. Uh, uh, question and answer. Right, right, right. Uh, my honored lord. My dear fellow. Uh, how are you? Afflicted. In what way? Transformed. Inside or out? Both. I see. Not much new there. No! <laughs> Go into details, Del. Probe the background. Establish the situation. Ha, 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 ha. So, uh... Your uncle is the king of Denmark. And my father before him. And his father before him. No, my father before him. Uh, but surely... Well, you might well ask. Let me get this straight. Your father's king. You're his only heir. Your father dies. Your uncle becomes king. Right. Unorthodox. Undignable. Undeniable. Where were you? Germany. Usurpation, then? He slipped in. Which reminds me. Well, it would. I don't want to be personal. Oh, it's common knowledge. Your mother's married. He slipped in. The body was still warm. So was hers. Extraordinary. Hasty. Indecent. Suspicious. It makes you think. Don't think I haven't thought of it. With her husband's brother. They were close. She went to him. Too close. For comfort. It looks bad. It adds up. Incest to adultery. Would you go so far? Never. Now, to sum up, <laughs> your father whom you love dies, you are his only heir, you come home to find that hardly is a corpse cold before his younger brother has popped onto his throne and into his sheets, thereby offending both legal and natural practice. Now, why exactly are you behaving in this extraordinary manner? <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> Thinking of what uh, you know, what might be of interest to people as as relates, you know, what how Angus handled people. I uh, was directing my first uh, Shakespearean play here, and it was the Scottish tragedy. And uh, <laughs> Angus <laughs> Angus had not been around for a lot of the rehearsal period. I can't remember whether he had been ill at the time, but uh, I was pretty much winging it myself, and uh, I thought uh, I thought I was uh, pretty hot. Uh, and we were we were well into the rehearsal period. We were getting ready, as a matter of fact, to have our first uh, preview performance, first performance before an audience, and I thought that things were really, really going along swimmingly. Uh, we had just had the final dress rehearsal the night before, and I thought, okay, I've got a great idea. I will go over, I'll confer with Angus, see, have him tell me how good he thought the play was, and then I'll be able to go back and, and for the pep talk that I give my cast the next, uh, for, for opening, you know, I'll be able to say, Angus says this and this and this and this. So I went bopping up to Angus's office. It was very, very very cocky, and uh, like I say, thought I was pretty hot, the show was pretty hot, and we chatted a while, and then I said, well, what, what did you think, how do how you, you like the show, how's the show going? And he said, well, 
It's not a bad show. <laughs> it's just not very exciting. And I said to myself, thanks a lot, Angus. <laughs> I've got to go over and tell my cast who's just getting ready to go for an audience. It's not a bad show, it's just not very exciting. <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, we'll, we'll show him. You know, and I went over to the cast before, uh, for pep talk before the, the preview and told them what a fabulous show it was, how exciting the show was. And so uh, they, you know, were, were up and, and ready to go and went out and did the play. And, performed it for several times, and pretty soon the reviews began to come in, and that word of mouth got around and so forth. And if you could have taken all the reviews and the word of mouth and put it in a big hopper and stirred it up and, and come out with one piece of consensus about the show, it would have been, uh, it's not a bad show. <laughs> it's not very exciting. <laughs> And I finally came to that conclusion that, uh, that Angus was probably right. And I asked myself later on, well, why would he choose that particular time to, to deflate me as he did? Uh, it was, would not have been in his nature to dissemble at that point. And it was also an act of kindness for a, a young green uh, director who was riding for a fall that he was able to let me down in a a rather gentle manner, uh, which could have been much more traumatic had I read some of the tough reviews first. But then I was able to say, no, no, it's not a bad show. Angus Bomer says it's not a bad show. <laughs> it's just not very exciting. <laughs> occasions that Angus was actually performing was on this very stage uh, at the festival's birthday, I mean, Sh William Shakespeare's birthday party last spring, a year ago, spring. And at that time, we, Rex and I did a thing that we've done, speaking of the Scottish tragedy, a couple of times, and Angus had never heard it, and it was a real joy to do it for him. He was not fond of Macbeth, I do think we did. <laughs> was not his favorite play. As a matter of fact, he says that's the only one in his experience of Shakespeare that read better than it played. <laughs> not very exciting. <laughs> but anyway, we did this this piece by, is it James Thurber? Yes. That who did it? Oh. Anyway, called the Macbeth murder mystery. So, and, and he liked this, I think, moderately well. Anyway, he laughed. That was standing right over there, he was laughing. <laughs> How'd we break this up? Do you remember? Do you read the said the American woman? Yes. Okay. It was a stupid mistake to Said make. the American woman. I had met in my hotel at the English Lake Country. But it was on the counter with the other penguin books, you know, the little sixpenny ones with the paper covers. And I suppose, of course, it was a detective story. All the others were detective stories. I'd read all the others. So I bought this one without really looking at it carefully. You can imagine how mad I was when I found out it was Shakespeare. <laughs> I murmured something sympathetically. I don't see why the penguin books people had to get out Shakespeare's plays in the same size and everything as the detective stories. <laughs> I... I think they have different colored jackets. <laughs> I didn't notice that. Anyway, I got real comfy in bed that night, all ready to read a good mystery story, and here I had the tragedy of Macbeth, the book for high school students, like Ivanhoe. Or Lord of Doom. Exactly, and there I was, just crazy for a good Agatha Christie or something. Hercule Poirot was my favorite detective. Is he the rabbit you want? No, he's the belt. Oh, you're thinking of Mr. Pinkerton, the one in Phelps Inspector Boy. He's good, too. Uh, yes, well, uh, did you read Macbeth? I had to read it. There wasn't a scrap of anything else to read in the whole room. Did you like it? No, I did not. In the first place, I don't think for a minute that Macbeth did it. <laughs> <laughs> did what? I don't think for a minute that he killed the king. I don't think the Macbeth woman was mixed up in it either. Well, you suspect them the most, of course, but those are the ones that are never guilty, or they shouldn't be anyway. Uh, I'm afraid don't I... Don't you see? It would spoil everything if you could figure out right away who did it. Now, Shakespeare was too smart for that. I've read people never have figured out Hamlet. <laughs> so it isn't likely Shakespeare would have made Macbeth as simple as it seems. Uh, who do you suspect? Macduff. 
Uh, good God. Oh, man. <laughs> did it all right. Her cool put on Poirot would have got him easily. Uh, how did you figure it out? Well, I didn't right away. First, I suspected Banquo. And then, of course, he was the second person good killed. That was good, that part in there. The person you suspected the first murder should always be the second victim. <laughs> Is that so? <laughs> yeah, they have to keep surprising you. <laughs> well, after the second murder, I didn't know who the killer was for a while. Uh, well, how about uh, Malcolm and Donaldbane, the King's sons? As I remember it, they fled right after the first murder. Now, that looks suspicious. Oh, too suspicious. Much too suspicious. When they flee, they're never guilty. You can count on that. I believe I'll have a brandy. Do you know who discovered Duncan's body? Uh, sorry that I uh, forgot. Macduff discovers it. Then he comes running downstairs and shouts, Confusion has broke open the Lord's anointed temper, and sacrilegious murder has made his masterpiece, and all, and all that stuff is rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't say a lot of stuff like that offhand, would you, if you found a body? No, of course not. You'd say, My God, there's a body in here. <laughs> I thought for a while. Uh, but what do you make of the third murderer? You know, the third murderer has puzzled Macbeth scholars for 300 years. That is because they never thought of Macduff. It was Macduff, I am certain. Now, you couldn't have one of the victims murdered by two ordinary thugs. The murderer always has to be somebody important. But what about the banquet scene? How do you account for Macbeth's guilty actions there when Banquo's ghost came in and sat in his chair? There wasn't any ghost. A big, strong man like that doesn't go around seeing ghosts. Especially in a brightly lighted banquet hall full of dozens of people, Macbeth was shielding somebody. Who was he shielding? Mrs. Macbeth, of course. He thought she did it, and he was going to take the rap himself. The husband always does that when the wife is suspected. Uh, well, but, uh, ah, ah, what about the sleepwalking scene well, there? the same thing, only the other way around. <laughs> that time, she was shielding him. She wasn't asleep at all. You remember where it says, enter Lady Macbeth with the taper? Yes. Well, people who walk in their sleep never carry lights. <laughs> Have a second sight. Now, did you ever hear of a sleepwalker carrying a light? No, I never did. Well, if she wasn't asleep, she was acting guilty to shield Macbeth. Oh. I think I'll have another brandy. <laughs> I, I believe you've got something there. Uh, uh, would you lend me that, Macbeth? I'd like to look it over tonight. I, I don't feel somehow as if I've ever really read it. <laughs> I'll get it for you. I read the play over carefully that night. The next morning after breakfast, I sought out the American woman. She was on the putting green, and I came up behind her silently and took her arm. Mm. She gave an exclamation. <laughs> Could I see you alone? You found out something? I found out the name of the murderer. You mean it wasn't Macduff? Oh, Macduff is as innocent of those murders as Macbeth and the Macbeth woman. I opened the copy of my play, which I had with me, and turned to Act Two, Scene Two. Here you will see where Lady Macbeth says, I laid their daggers ready. He could not miss him. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. Do you see? No, I don't. Oh, but it's simple. I wonder I didn't see it years ago. The reason Duncan resembled Lady Macbeth's father as he slept is that it actually was her father. <laughs> God. Oh, Lady Macbeth's father killed the king, and hearing someone coming, thrust the body under the bed and crawled into the bed himself. <laughs> you can't have a murderer who only appears in the story once. You can't have that. Well, I know that. I, I turn to Act 2, Scene 4. Here it says, Enter Roth with an old man. Now, that old man is never identified. And it is my contention he was old Mr. Macbeth, whose ambition it was to make his daughter queen. There you have your motive. Well, even then, he's still a minor character. Ah, uh, not when you realize that he was also one of the weird sisters in disguise. <laughs> you mean one of the three witches? <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> Listen to this speech of the old man's. On Tuesday last, a falcon towering in her pride of place was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. Who does that sound like? That sounds the way the three witches talk. Precisely. <laughs> well... Maybe you're right. Well, I'm sure I am. And you know what I'm going to do now? No, what? Buy a copy of Hamlet and solve that. <laughs> you don't think Hamlet did it? No, I'm absolutely positive he didn't. 
Who do you suspect? Everybody. <laughs> with Angus at times that I directed shows here. They uh, used to ask Dylan Thomas, do you believe in the Bible? And he would say, I'd, I'd be a damn fool if I didn't. And if they asked me, do you ever talk to Angus Bomer about your shows, then I would reply the same thing. There's a personal memory at one end of my remembrances of Angus and one at the other end that I'd like to share. I came here in 72, and I don't really remember where, when or where I met Angus, but my first clear memory it was that fall when we went into the schools to teach. It was the second year they'd ever done it. We were all very green at it and, and not too good. And um, that first weekend, we had to perform for the Portland Ad Club. And we were doing things from our town, which we'd been doing on the stage over here that fall. And I watched that little man get up in front of people and absolutely charm two to three hundred people right out of their seats. I couldn't believe his ease, the joking quality, and the deep, serious under layers that he was giving them. He said, we're here in the schools to develop young audiences. We noticed a few years ago that our audiences at the festival are getting older and older and older with a sad and inevitable result. So we're out here making a pitch. And I think it was a fundraising thing. He surrounded the two of us having to do the Our Town with such warmth and such ease. And that's my first clear remembrance of him, working with a large group of people, probably getting money from them, and establishing enormous goodwill for the festival. Uh, one of the last memories I have of him was uh, a year ago, April, when I came back from having directed a show in Phoenix, Arizona. The company had been in rehearsals about a week. I saw him on the bricks and was speaking to him, and as other people came across, he said, excuse me, and he called out to Annie Springer, who was a brand new actress who had only been here for a week at that time. He said, honey, have you found a place to live yet? And she said, no, I haven't, Mr. Bomer. He said, we'll keep looking. And somehow that intense personal concern for somebody in the company, plus the great concern for the festival and everybody coming to it, embodies so much of, of Angus for me. My first show that I directed on the outdoor stage was um, Twelfth Night. And I went to him because I had questions like, why isn't Violet ever identified by name? He said, I don't know, you figure it out. <laughs> I asked him about the use of the stage. I wanted to do a lot of number, uh, number of very cute things. He listened <laughs> very carefully. I said, you know, I'd really like to set the play in 1919, right after World War I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said, well, I think I could probably put it on one of those, you know, Tudor manor houses on the Isle of Wight and then have everybody as refugees from the war. Doesn't that sound neat? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then finally, after I'd gone on in this vein for some time, he said, Jim, you must realize a few things. Language is everything in Shakespeare. That stage is never more than a facade. It will never be an environment. It will never be a milieu. You can only use it as background and let the language bounce off of it and create the world through the language. Um, I paid about half attention to him. And then I went back and did the show that I wanted. He never criticized it. He was always supportive. And I knew he probably didn't totally approve. Months later, when I talked to him, he said, you're going to learn, Jim, very soon that language is everything. <laughs> I was having a lot of very fancy pre-dialogue pantomime. People teaching Viola how to be a boy and bow correctly and stuff like that. He taught me over the next two productions that I directed out there and conferred with him about the folly, basically, of that for that stage. He said, Shakespeare invented the lap dissolve, use it. Overlap your syllables if you can, which I'd learned from Jim Sando, who had directed here and directed me first in Colorado. Uh, 
the final one concerning Angus the director, because I think above all he was an actor, and we'll get to that in a minute. It was last year when I started to create Peter Quince in Midsummer Night's Dream. The only note that Angus or that Dennis Bigelow gave me on the first day of rehearsal is Peter Quince is Angus Bomer. Use it and go with it. So I dug into my memories of Angus about the perfectionist that he was, how everything had to be just right, and then reduced the intelligence of Peter Quince or his cultural expansion way down. And I remembered that uh, Angus had played the part, had in fact defined the part here, which is always a little rough to step into those shoes. I've done it twice now, stepping into Angus Bomer's shoes as an actor. But I'd like to do the, the prologue or the opening to the Pyramus and Thisbe scene um, as Peter Quince, that terribly eager and terribly anxious director of a group of rustics. <laughs> If we offend, it is with our good will that you should think we come not to offend, but with good will to show our simple skill that is the true beginning of our end. <laughs> Consider then, we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to content you, our true intent is all for your delight. We are not here. <laughs> that you should here repent you, the actors are at hand, and by their show, you shall know all that you are like to know. <laughs> Mrs. Bomer, who is not a exactly unprejudiced <laughs> viewer, said that, that Except for Angus, Jimmy's was the best quint she'd ever seen. <laughs> she recognized it right away. Will you do the, the other speech from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern? Uh, this is from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern also. It just struck me from what Jimmy said that the one of the Guildenstern's line in the first scene that we did, what have we got to go on, might have come from Angus's mouth when he started the festival so many years ago, when it was just words, words. They're all we have to go on. Um, this. Angus was the most childlike wise man I ever met in my life, probably ever will meet, and this is for him. <clears throat> we are actors. Demented children, mincing about in clothes that no one ever wore, speaking as no man ever spoke, swearing love in wigs and rhymed couplets, hollow protestations of faith hurled after empty promises of vengeance, and every word every gesture vanishing into the thin, unpopulated air. We ransomed our dignities to the clouds, and the uncomprehending birds listened. Don't you see? We are actors. We're the opposite of people. We pledged our identity secure in the conventions of our trade that someone would be watching, and gradually no one was. It wasn't until the murderer's long soliloquy, frozen as we were in profile, we were able to look about. Our eyes searched you out, at first hesitantly, and then desperately, as each patch of turf, each corner, each log proved uninhabited. We put down our cloths of gold, our wooden swords and our crowns, and moved silently down the road toward Elsinore. Bruce has to go get his dirt on. <laughs> the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> one of the tribunes of the people in the show this afternoon, and he's not too nice either. <laughs> to see how he feels about his people, I think that's why you Yes, would you talk a little bit, are you ready to talk a little bit about the show? Yes. Uh, a very, very significant uh, experience and memory for me. Uh, it's, it's very personal. I hope that it, you know, I can share that with you. It may be, well, uh, 
Angus was going to play Shylock for the first time in the new Bomer, the fairly new Bomer. Uh, he was to play it and direct it as well. And I had uh, two roles in that. I was playing the Duke of Venice and Old Gabo. And we were all very, very excited because it was, uh, it was to be his, his first Shylock. Uh, Any time he did Shylock, it was an event. And this was to be his first one in the, in the Bomer in his new theater. And, and uh, there was a great deal of excitement about that. And we were well into the rehearsal period. We'd scheduled our first run through. And my chrono chronology may be a little hazy uh, here on some of these points. So some of the chronology may, may be out of order, but, but the essence is, is what's important. And it, it's all there. Uh, sometime before the first run through, he had had an angina attack, and he had been ill previously, and um, he spent some time in the emergency room, but, but it, you know, it looked like he, he was going to be all right. And, but there began to be rumors about how uh, other people, uh, someone else was being called in to play the role, and, but it was all in the stage of rumors at this point. Um, so we were going to have the run through anyway. Angus came in, he was tired, and uh, a bit uh, ashen, but wanted to do the run-through anyway. And uh, so we went into the run-through, bare stage, work lights, street clothes. And it was a little rough at first, but as we got into it, Angus began to pick up steam. And, and suddenly, the entire atmosphere became very, very galvanized. And people, instead of making their exits and going down to the green room, were stopping in the bonds and stopping in the, in the wings to watch this incredible display of now what was becoming a great display of energy and uh, electricity from Angus's part. He would played the roles many times before. He didn't have to search around for new things at this point. And pretty soon everyone, uh, the whole cast was just standing watching. I thought all of a sudden, I thought, my God, I'm seeing Angus's farewell performance of Shylock. And it was very, very moving at that point. I went to Michael Winters, who was standing over there, and I said, do you realize? He said, yeah. Um, it was one of those things that later I thought, well, that was, that was an event for me. And in the future, I'll be able to look back and say, yeah, I was there uh, that the night that Angus did that. And just with, you know, with the language and his instrument essentially showed all of us in the cast who had become the audience at that point. This, ladies and gentlemen, is, is how you play Shylock. So I just thought I'd share that with you.